So when we were deep in this research, we took these driving forces that we identified and we applied them to five hypothetical cities to help us imagine how the future could show up in different scenarios. So our five cities were vulnerable, dense, efficient, booming, and green. And so we'll just take a look at one of those now as an example. If you picture a vulnerable city is probably the easiest to picture. We've all heard, um, if you think about uh, coastal cities with issues like what's going on in New York City or Miami with flooding, um, circularity, diversification, and decentralization become really important. So you might need those diver diversified food sources close to the city, like nearby farms, hydroponic pods, maybe lab-grown meat, um, all nearby. And you can still source from further away food sources, but these options are really beneficial in case there is a scarcity issue. Or for another example, um, there was just recently that huge snowstorm in the Northeast. So that highlights a need for nimble logistics like automated routing technology or a diversified fleet, different kind of vehicles. Um, if distributors could use weather analytics and real-time transit data to be more nimble and anticipate problems, they could make changes during their in-progress uh, routes and get around some of those challenges. And then finally, it's something we end up talking about a lot at Relish is this concept of micro-fulfillment centers, which we stumbled across during this, this project. Um, and these micro-fulfillment centers is a way to instead of having a huge distribution center, it capitalizes on data and predictive analytics to store really specific products in multiple locations around a city based on what people in that market are buying, their ordering history. Um, this is how Amazon Prime can get you really random items within 24 hours. So you could see how a network like that would be useful if there were weather challenges, if the infrastructure broke down in some way this would, this decentralized distribution would help keep things running. So, like I said, we did this work a couple of years ago, and I think what's been really exciting to see it grow and change over time is that we did not predict having a pandemic and huge supply chain breakdowns. It wasn't on our, our bingo card or scenario list of disasters, but a lot of the solutions and technologies that came out of this project still helped us weather that storm and helped our parent company adapt to some of the changes we faced in the past couple of years, which I think is, is just a testament to the power of scenario planning exercises or this looking towards the future and starting to take steps to make those changes. So I'll close with the um, future fulfillment video that we created. It was a sort of summary and outward look at this project. And then I'll turn it over to Stephanie. People with ADHD save 10 hours studying with this Chrome extension, but no, by all means. By 2050, 80% of food is now consumed in cities. People have moved there for job opportunities and to reap the benefits of efficient urban living. As the city has become denser, more complex, more connected, and intelligently zoned, we have adapted to get fresh ingredients quickly to where they're needed to meet increased consumer demand. Ingredients of our food rely on the same processes as always, water, light, and nutrients coming together. But radical innovations will change where the food comes from, whether vertical farms, a skyscraper's roof, or food labs. Autonomous shared transit and environmentally friendly vehicles have resulted in cities with fewer accidents, more green space, greater walkability, and shared community experiences with friends and neighbors. The city will demand last mile solutions that don't disrupt the flow of urban living. To operate competitively, distributors have created an autonomous cold chain enabled fleet that can nimbly deliver to every kind of customer. Fleets weave between micro fulfillment centers and destinations. Autonomous vehicles are programmed to carry goods in whatever way is quickest, whether driverless truck, boat, or drone. These vehicles are the last link in a chain that begins just outside the city at urban consolidation centers, which sort, arrange, and repackage goods coming into the city. Regulations now require all freight vehicles to pass through urban consolidation centers, where competitors must collaborate and coordinate through joint deliveries. New automation technology and predictive modeling help reduce vehicle miles traveled. Smart tracking has eliminated extra food waste with leftovers being donated to people in need. 
All packaging and shipping materials used in the process are now reused or recycled, helping establish a strong circular economy. In a future where unforeseen challenges stress supply chains, companies are able to adapt and respond quickly, a great asset when operating in vulnerable areas. Cities offer big opportunities for innovation. As urban centers evolve and grow, fulfilling fresh, sustainable, and healthy food will be a more pressing challenge. We are interested in pioneering new ways to solve this challenge. All righty. Um, so we are going to definitely switch gears and talk more about how food moves people. And before we get started, I'm going to drop a question in the chat. Um, you all can respond in the chat or, um, you know, just kind of think about it. But uh, the question is, would you sign up for a meal program that was recommended by your doctor and personalized for you? So um, you can either kind of submit something right now or think about it along the way and answer while I am talking about this. But so as Kate mentioned earlier, in 2020, RelishWorks started an effort in collaboration with a GFS customer, Spectrum Health, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, to explore how food can positively impact health conditions, also known as food as medicine. So our customer, Spectrum Health, um, was looking for ways to expand upon their lifestyle medicine initiative which really focused on provi providing holistic healthcare. So this means looking across all things that might impact one's health um, versus looking at everything in a silo. So looking at physical activity, family history, and food and diet. So as I mentioned, one aspect of that lifestyle medicine um, is a patient's food and diet. And while nutrition is always important, it's especially critical um, when it comes to prevention and disease management. So this is where our exploration around food as medicine really started to come in. And one piece of food as medicine that's been getting traction in the last about decade is the concept of medically tailored meals. So these are meals that are designed around specific medical conditions and disease states that have been shown to positively impact symptoms uh, disease progression and decrease the utilization of medical services needed for a patient. So how this started was prior to the pandemic, GFS, Relish Works, and Spectrum Health collaborated to design this medically ta tailored meal program for seniors with congestive heart failure. Spectrum was really interested in looking at this population because a significant number of their readmissions um, came from patients that were living with congestive heart failure. Other disease states that we did consider and explore were diabetes, um, kidney failure, and we even looked at high blood pressure. Um, but we decided to go with CHF, congestive heart failure, because as I mentioned, Spectrum had a large population of these patients in their community that they cared for. And we also believe that this could have the greatest, um, this population would have the greatest impact on their overall health with these meals. Um, so this program was called Do Right Dinner, and it was aimed to provide medically tailored meals to patients with congestive heart failure after they were discharged from the hospital for 70 days. So initially, um, when we started this project, due, the, due to the pandemic, um, it was put on hold because Spectrum needed to care um, for their patients and their employees. But we um, luckily found new life for this project when an opportunity from the Michigan Health Endowment Fund came up in 2020 to apply for a grant called the Healthy Aging Grant. Um, and actually through the application process, we were connected with another healthcare system, Beaumont Health, which is also in Michigan, um, who was submitting a similar grant around medically tailored meals. So between Beaumont Health, Spectrum Health and Relish Works, we ended up partnering and applying for that grant together to receive funding to help cover a pilot for this medically tailored meal program. Um, and thankfully in 2020, uh, November, we found out that we were awarded the Healthy Aging Grant to fund a two-year pilot that would start in March, 2021. So for the past year, we've been running this pilot in collaboration with the healthcare systems. 
So I want to dive in and take a little bit of time of looking at how it works. So um, I will say that something to call out is that this pilot plan map um, is for the service. And I will say now that we are a year into the pilot and have been serving patients for over six months, there have been a ton of game time decisions and changes along the way. So um, one thing to know is you can map and map and map for days, but when you're actually implementing it, things change so drastically and um, things come up that you would never expect. Um, but to start, so the goal of this specific program was to improve the health of the patient um, and reduce the readmissions for the seniors living with congestive heart failure. So the patients would hear about it um, when they are admitted to the hospital. So at discharge, they would be notified that they are eligible to participate and re could receive seven meals per week over the course of 10 weeks. So a meal for every evening. And the reason we decided on seven meals was because there are research with seniors as well as dietitians. We heard that dinner is really the only meal that all seniors eat. And we also heard that even one healthy meal could make a significant positive impact in their overall health. So once the patients sign up at the hospital, they then would receive weekly deliveries and they're able to provide feedback on these meals that they receive every week, which we saw as a way to understand what meals were they actually eating. So this helped us um, not only measure the desirability of this, this program and the me meals, but also accountability for the seniors. What meals were they actually eating? What did they actually enjoy? And was this something that they were gonna sustain over time? So at the end of the 70 days of the program, the patient would meet with the dietitian and figure out how they can continue this healthy eating and lifestyle. So this program does provide meals to help you get back on your feet and recover after being hospitalized, but it's also meant to facilitate and foster behavioral change in their eating habits and healthy lifestyle overall. So it helps them understand what's actually going into the food that they're eating and maybe how bad some of their lean cuisine, like healthy options were, um, or the Jimmy Dean sausage that they've grown to love growing up, how um, that was impacting their body. I would say that, you know, especially for this generation, there's a misunderstanding of what is healthy. So, you know, corn is their favorite vegetable and many of them, um, it's not a full dinner if there's not meat and potatoes on the plate. Um, they have a very Midwestern palate and sometimes that food is not the healthiest, especially for seniors living with congestive heart failure. So this education component of the service was really um, extremely crucial for the success of the program. So with every delivery, the patients receive recipe cards and nutrition information to learn about why what they were eating was good for their specific condition. So um, because I have congestive heart failure, this meal, not that meal. So I wanna transition a little bit to how it's going. So as you can see on the screen, these are our meals. So meatloaf and sweet potatoes, almond chicken and potatoes. These meals really started introducing ingredients that these seniors have never had. Many of them had never um, made quinoa or had sweet potatoes. And so it was really opening up their palates to new um, food that they could eat that would be good for their body. So as I mentioned, we launched the pilot in March, 2020. And there was some, or 2021, sorry, March, 2021. And there was a two month planning process. So we started serving patients in the summer of 2021. So with about six months, seven months under our belt, we've served over 140 patients. We've added oh, about a half a dozen new recipes based on patient feedback, what's working well, maybe recipes that weren't working well. And we've had dietitians and chefs test them along with caregivers and patients to ensure that this is quality food, not only for their body, but things that they actually enjoy eating. I think enjoying it and not seeing it as just healthy eating was really important to us as well. And I will say that um, one other thing that has, as I mentioned, maybe not gone directly to the plan that we outlined is we initially had a last mile delivery being um, something that Gordon Food Service would be able to do through their trucks and fleet vans and stuff, but we are also testing other ways to do it through like a drop ship option to some patients. And so we're just continuing to iterate along the way and learn um, over this two-year pilot. 
So I think that the best way to kind of wrap up Do Right Dinners is to show you all kind of the patient impact that we have seen so far. So um, here is a video to kind of recap the patient experience. And let me know if you can't hear. Um... Do Right Dinner is a fantastic grant that we have funded by the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. The idea behind it is really something that goes back centuries around food as medicine and three different problems, aging Americans, chronic disease, and access to nutritious, healthy foods all could be impacted through a Do Right Dinner's medically tailored meal grant. We believe in the power of food and how that's played out in the healthcare setting is that food has often been a recommendation from a physician to someone suffering with chronic conditions, but it hasn't been a treatment plan. It hasn't been a prescribed routine. Do Right Dinner's motto is healthy just got easy, and that could not be more true. We are sending convenient meals that can be warmed up right in the microwave that can be made in minutes right in their home. Now, I've lost a lot of weight. When 294, now I weigh 261. They finally took me off for insulin and feel good about myself. Yeah, I'm eating healthier. I thought I was doing good in, in the food I made my family because I didn't add a lot of salt to things. But Do Right really taught me a lot about how many things we eat has sodium in it. I'm more observant when the food I buy in the stores and what I eat and how much I eat. So it's really, like it says, I feel terrific though. With the Do Right program, they know what she can eat and what she's allowed to eat. And so they give us options. When a patient has congestive heart failure, they have to follow a low sodium diet. And sometimes they are also on a fluid restriction. So their world can be turned upside down when they are told, okay, now you have to really limit how much salt you are eating. And you have to watch all this fluid that you're taking in. And it's confusing, it's overwhelming. And then when they get home, if they go back to kind of their just same old eating habits, they will be right back in the hospital. And so that's why a program like this is so impactful. I love my popcorns. You got to give me that popcorns. This is her. There's a response and a reflection, I think, coming out of code where everybody's, you know, thirsting for health. And I think in a lot of ways, food is the next way to be healthy. For 125 years, uh, Gordon Food Service has been supplying food to restaurants, hotels, hospitals, nursing homes, and now we get the opportunity to really lean into food as medicine, which fits perfectly into the mission of Gordon Food Service, making an impact on people. The food tastes better, you feel better, you lose weight, you're comfortable, you're excited. That I am. And I like that feeling. And I like to compliment you guys for what you did for me and do for others. Um, I saw that there was one question in the chat really quickly around the research from the meals that were provided frozen versus refrigerated. And I would say from a desirability and a feasibility standpoint, that was one of the questions that we tossed around for such a long time because we were, um, from an operation standpoint, delivering frozen food for GFS is much easier than keeping things that are fresh um, at the temperature they need to in the time of the delivery. Uh, and I, I think we were concerned that frozen would make the quality be diminished, but we actually went with a flash frozen um, approach and that helped with the quality as well as this was a, something that this generation is comfortable with. They are very comfortable and familiar with frozen dinners, um, cooking from the freezer. And so it's something that they actually wanted and asked for in the research. So we can expand upon that during the, uh, the Q&A, but I did just want to address that question. So I will hand it back over to you, Kate. Great. Oops. 
Well, as I said early, um, earlier on in the presentation, you know, we, we do look beyond what people want. Um, but I will say that that is still absolutely central to the work that we do. Um, you know, we are a group of researchers, designers, strategists, entrepreneurs, and we are absolutely focused on creating solutions for the users that we're working with, creating things that work for our stakeholders and our collaborators in the business, and also working really closely with partners and startups in our ecosystem.